Here we recap high level cell respiration. So to start with, uh, you need to reorient yourself where we are in a cell. So we've got the first stage here, glycolysis occurring out in the cytosol or the liquid part of the cytoplasm um, in the main part of the cell. And then the remainder of the events occurring here inside the mitochondrion. And you've probably heard that cliched thing that mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell. So that's when we're extracting most of our energy from um, our food that we digest and then absorb. Um, and that's where we're able to load up a whole lot of ATP. So glycolysis is first stage here, focusing on the change from glucose to pyruvate. Glucose is our main molecule we'll look at. So our steps here, um, reminder, it's occurring in the cytosol. The first thing that happens is that this glucose molecule, which I've shown here just by using um, the carbons, and, it, and the same thing that we did when we looked at the Kelvin cycle in photosynthesis, it's a bit messy if we include the oxygen and the hydrogen. So just focusing on the number of carbons here, so that's kind of the main thing we need to follow. So glucose is a six carbon molecule. Phosphorylation is the addition of phosphate groups here on either end of the molecule, which helps to destabilize it a bit so that it breaks more easily. Um, the second stage then is the breaking, lysis. So that means splitting, which we see in a lot of things, but likely here coming from sweet. So you're talking about the breaking of sugars. So it breaks in half. Um, then we have a step of oxidation. So from this little three carbon sugar here, we've still got um, a three carbon molecule, but we've changed, um, well, there's a movement of electrons happening here. So if you're not a chemist, don't worry. Um, just know that if electrons are lost from something, it's become oxidized, which may also occur when um, it reacts with oxygen. And then that always, the electrons have to go somewhere else. So something else in the same time is reduced. And this is where this little carrier molecule over here comes in. So when it's unloaded, when it, before it's been reduced, um, we just write NAD plus. And then what it gets, gets some electrons. So they're shown in sort of this pink color here um, that have come from our sugar molecule and some hydrogen is associated with it. Um, one of them, we get a whole hydrogen atom. The other, we get the electron and then the proton that's left behind, the H plus is an associated little um, ion there. So some textbooks will just say NADH. Others will write NADH and H plus because they go together. Um, so what we get here, so we've had our carbohydrate has been oxidized and we've got extra phosphorylation happening. And then in exchange, when this little carrier molecule over here, which is technically a coenzyme, um, that's loaded up with electrons and hydrogen that's been reduced. And then the phosphate groups come off our carbohydrate so we generate some new ATP molecules. Now, if we want to break that down a little bit more and kind of use something a bit more visual, and go back to this little animation here. So here's our six carbon sugar at the start, our glucose. This represents some ATP, so the adenosine triphosphate. And we can see that that phosphorylation that happens here so that's now become ADP. That one. Now phosphate's been added. So we actually had to use up some ATP in the first place. Then we get our splitting, our lysis stage. Then we get some more phosphate added, although note that that doesn't actually come from ATP. That's just inorganic phosphate that's been added. But in the process, and I've kind of just shown these hydrogens hiding in here um, because we know we didn't include them all at the start, but just show that that's where they come from, that our hydrogens go to these carrier molecules. So NAD plus becomes NADH with H plus. So that here was um, a reduction of the carrier and the sugar, the three carbon compound was oxidized. And then our final step here of glycolysis, we lose our phosphates and they go to generating new ATP. So overall, from this process, we started with glucose and then we ended up with pyruvate. We used two ATP, but we gained four. So the net gain was only two. And we also got two of our carrier molecules 
became reduced. So they now carry um, electrons and some hydrogen as well, which will be used later on. So from here, we head into the mitochondria to do the other processes. So that was glycolysis outside here in the cytosol. Um, then we move into here. This part in the middle is our matrix. Um, that's our sort of liquidy goo part of our mitochondrion. And we can see here that it's double membrane. So it's got a membrane here and a membrane there. And we can see these membranes have infoldings here. It's kind of hard to tell where one part starts and another one stops actually. It goes most of the way across some of them. Now these infoldings here are called Christie. Um, and that just gives the mitochondria lots of surface area and then the ability to build up um, concentration gradients here. So there's a very, very small space inside here, inside the Christi that, um, so if you store some ions or some sort of chemical compound in there, you get a really, really, really big difference um, very, very quickly. What we have here, we can see these are ribosomes as well. Um, and they are 70S ribosomes. That's the size that we find in, mono, um, in bacteria. We have 80S otherwise in our eukaryotic cells. So that's a good indication of that endosymbiotic theory. Also the fact that it's double membrane. So good suggestion that perhaps a prokaryotic cell here with one membrane was engulfed by phagocytosis by another cell um, and both membranes were retained. All right, so now that we are in the mitochondria, um, and that's facilitated diffusion, by the way, so it's passive, but it's facilitated, meaning that it needs a channel or a protein. Um, the next stage, our pyruvate, which is our three carbon molecule here, um, gets decarboxylated. So one of those carbons is removed. And in fact, it's a carbon dioxide that's removed. And this is a little link reaction before we can go any further. Now, the coenzyme needed for this is called um, acetyl coenzyme A. Um, well, sorry, the, the coenzyme is CoA, and what the product that's made is acetyl CoA. We can see here that we've got the, that's the coenzyme, and that's the acetyl group here. And that's a two carbon remainder of the pyruvate. And then, of course, one of our carbons is lost as carbon dioxide. And then we have this carrier molecule, another one of these NADH and H plus over here. So for each pyruvate, we've lost a carbon dioxide. We've got this acetyl CoA and we've reduced a carrier molecule. And of course, um, we saw in glycolysis that one glucose gave rise to two pyruvate molecules. Molecules, so you'd have to double everything if you wanted to know a tally of how much you were getting per glucose molecule. So you would do this twice, two lots of carbon dioxide removed, two lots of acetyl-CoA, and two uh, charged or reduced carrier molecules. All right, let's go back to our little overview. So we've got uh, glycolysis. We've used two ATP, but we got four out, so we've got two gained in total. We've now headed into the mitochondrion. We have this link reaction is what we're looking at now where um, you can get, you know, the, there'll be some differences depending on what's going on here. It's a bit variable, but the main thing to focus on is these um, two reduced carrier molecules. And we can see that from both these things, so the NADH has come from the link reaction and from glyco glycolysis, they're heading towards a process that's going to occur at the end that's really important in generating all our ATP. So the next stage, let's look at the Krebs cycle. In the cycle, we need to regenerate what we start with. So here's our acetyl-CoA. That was from our link reaction. Now that has to join an existing four-carbon molecule. So we recycle, we sort of unload this coenzyme here, this CoA, so that can be used again in the link reaction. We now have a six carbon molecule over here. 
Now we need to break this up to get back to being round at the start again. So we remove the carbon dioxide, which we've just indicated by showing one of the carbons has left. So we've gone from six carbon molecule here to five carbon. And we can also see that we get one carrier molecule loaded here or reduced. Same thing again. So hydrogens and electrons to our reduced carrier and also another CO2, remembering that we call that decarboxylation when we lose that CO2. So we're back to having a four carbon compound, which is what we want, but it's not in the same configuration as what we started with and we can still extract um, some more energy out of this and we can still load some more carrier molecules. So in this last step, we see that um, we're able to charge ATP and we get some hydrogen to two different types of carrier molecules. So NAD we've seen all the way along, which becomes NADH and H+, and then FAD becomes FADH2. And it's just another example of a coenzyme or a little carrier that can be loaded here with electrons and hydrogen for later on. And we saw that was our um, ATP. So if we look at our tally so far, we've, if we've used one pyruvate mo molecule here to make with our original glucose, we made two carbon dioxide. Uh, we've got three of the NAD carrier molecules loaded one FAD and we've made one ATP. But of course, if we wanted to follow that through for a whole glucose molecule, we'd have to double everything. So we go around again. Deposit the acetyl group, the later CoA that can go off and be used again. Decarboxylate and reduce the carrier. Decarboxylate and reduce the carrier. Phosphorylate some ATP. There it is there. And reduce two different carrier molecules. Um, so that's our complete two turns of the Krebs cycle and our tally of what we've made for one glucose molecule. So if we wanted to see those steps written, if that helps for your notes or to see that that's the way you learn, that's fine. You may also like to draw it perhaps in a um, sort of a, the cycle as a diagram with arrows and just numbers to represent the size of the molecules. That's commonly used in an exam question. So if you wanted to redraw that, you would start with a four carbon compound to become a six carbon. And you would show that that was the, from the acetyl-CoA that so we had a deposit of two carbons. And that would go around to being a five carbon molecule. And four carbon again, but not the same four carbon molecule. And the names are not required for your exam. We well, do need to know things like these carriers. So you need to know that here, for example, uh, it's a little bit wobbly. Let me just try that again. So uh, NAD becomes NADH and H plus. And this arrow I'm just drawing coming out. So this um, has been changed, but this one here is just a decarboxylation. So the carbon dioxide coming out here. We have the same thing here. So we have another NAD extracting some electrons and hydrogens. and another decarboxylation. So these first two are the same, and then the last one is the one that's different. The last one has three things happening. We have no more decarboxylation, because how could we? We're going from four carbon to four carbon, so no more carbon is leaving. Our NAD, we still have that one. We squeeze it in there. One more NAD, then we have that new one, FAD. 
slightly different in that both hydrogens actually do attach to that one. And then we also have inorganic phosphate and ADP generating one molecule of ATP. So that's the way you might abbreviate it or see something similar in an exam. And try to use these words if you can in your written answers, things like decarboxylation and recognising we are calling it the Krebs cycle, also known as the citric acid cycle. Um, talking about reduction, when we're talking about hydrogen and electrons being added to these carrier molecules here, or coenzymes they're also called, and remembering the, those names or those abbreviations, here, the different types. All right, our next step, that's our Krebs cycle done. The last thing is what we're actually using all of these for. So these loaded or charged coenzymes here, reduced carriers, um, are now going to get used in the next and final stage. So we call this oxidative phosphorylation. So our carrier molecules from those um, the Krebs cycle and also the link reaction and glycolysis, this one we've got a lot of now, they've been reduced. The opposite is for them to be oxidised. So that means their electrons come off and those protons. Now those electrons are quite high energy excited electrons. They can be passed along a series of proteins known as the electron transport chain and these proteins pump hydrogen ions or protons um, into that very small space in those crystal, in those little infoldings of that membrane in the mitochondrion. And we get a lot of hydrogen ions building up. So they are able to make a really high concentration gradient, and we say it's chemiosmotic, um, and they can move back through a, a channel. So they can't, um, they are otherwise trapped there on one side of the membrane, but an ATP synthase molecule is an enzyme that generates ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Uh, and it's mechanical. We can see this little animation down here. Um, this is showing the hydrogen ions building up on one side and as they pass down through the ATP synthase, there is some rotation there. And there's some movement of so these little heads on this molecule that's bringing the ATP and inorganic phosphate closer together and catalyzing that reaction to make ATP. So we have this formation of lots of ATP from this little turnstile, this kind of little gate here that's turning around. Now we call this phosphorylation because we're adding phosphorus to ADP. So that's the name given to this ATP synthesis. And specifically at this stage, it is oxidative because it's coupled to the oxidation of these carrier molecules. Now, that's quite different to what we've seen so far. When we've made a little bit of ATP and glycolysis and the Krebs cycle, um, that's actually called substrate level phosphorylation um, because that's required some chemical organic intermediate to attach the phosphate to. This doesn't. This uses a mechanical method and this chemiosmosis is built up of a gradient and this little turnstile apparatus. So this is the oxidative phosphorylation here. Um, where we generate lots and lots of ATP. And the discovery of this is quite a paradigm shift in the way we thought about ATP generation. Because previously, um, we thought that all ATP was made at the substrate level. After this, um, our hydrogen ions and our electrons have to be collected by something. Um, so oxygen is there to pick them up. Oxygen reacts with our hydrogen ions and electrons to form water. And that's why water is a waste product of respiration. Now another way we can draw this, I've set this up a bit like the photosynthesis one. Um, a lot of diagrams show the um, ATP synthase pointing the other way, so just be careful um, depending on which textbook, which reference you use, make sure you um, are clear about which side is the intermembrane space, so that's the infolding of the Christi and the mitochondrial matrix which is the goo out in the middle. Label this like we did both synthesis. We have ATP synthase. So the same enzyme over here. And this is just a very, very rough kind of um, stylized version. We have the arrival of NADH and H. 
So this gets oxidized. So we have electrons coming off and hydrogen ions. The hydrogen ions we can see there, the electrons are deposited here on a carrier molecule. And it will be passed along. In the process, so those high energy excited electrons can be used to drive the pumping of those hydrogen ions into that really small space. So if we kind of imagine, even if we kind of filled in the bottom, brought it up a bit, um, to show that that's actually like very, very small gap there and that's much bigger on the other side. So I think we'll leave it or it'll get, it'll ruin the rest of the picture. All right, we then have the other carrier molecule. Now you don't need to do this level of detail, but if you're interested, um, they actually arrive at slightly different spots here. The FADH2 um, only makes use of two of these pumps, whereas at the NADH and H plus, the electrons are slightly higher in energy and it can drive three pumps, hydrogen across. But the electrons come off the FAD, it's, and they join the other electrons here in this transport chain. They take the same pathway the rest of the way, which is used to pump more hydrogen ions across into the small space until we get lots and lots of these hydrogen ions over here or protons. So we have a high concentration versus a low on the other side. Now those electrons, we'll just leave them here for the moment. They will need to be um, taken up by something at the end. Our hydrogen ions, they are now having a really high chemiosmotic gradient. They can bank up behind this, back up behind this little ATP synthase, move through, and they will mechanically turn that molecule to make ATP. Now I've written M5 here as an approximation. So that's roughly um, here from one NADH and H plus molecule, you get about three ATP. And from FADH2, you get about two. Um, so roughly there from what's arrived, what we're showing there, we would get five. And this is just, that's obviously not all the hydrogen or I've run out of space. But the hydrogen there, um, we need to do something with these and with the electrons. So that's where our oxygen comes in. That's why you need to breathe um, to keep your cells alive because you need a supply of energy and you need oxygen in order to unlock the energy from your glucose or other food that you are using in respiration. And we make water as a result. So that's our overview. That's all we've had happening. Here's a last look at this picture again. So by now you should um, be clear on glycolysis is the splitting of the glucose out in the cytosol. Four um, ATP are generated, but two are used up. So we get a net gain of two. And we also get two of these reduced carrier molecules. Then we head into the mitochondria where we have the link reaction, where we have the pyruvate being decarboxylated. So we lose two carbon dioxide molecules but we get two acetyl-CoA. We have this coenzyme attached to the remainder, which is able to transport our carbon into the Krebs cycle. Where it joins a four-carbon molecule to make six, loses some carbon dioxide in two steps of decarboxylation, and we get lots of carrier molecules. We get some more NADH, and we also get this FADH2 here. Um, we also get a little bit of ATP coming out of the Krebs cycle. And then the majority of our ATP generation occurs at the last stage here in our electron transport chain, which comes from these carrier molecules depositing high energy electrons, which are used to pump hydrogen ions into this space. So here, these infoldings, these Christi, that is the intermembrane space inside there. And then when they come back out against um, going down the chemiosmotic gradient through the ATP synthase, we make lots of ATP and we call that oxidative phosphorylation as opposed to the ATP made here and here, which is called substrate level phosphorylation.